This week in H10 EMA, we've been looking at a couple of common circuit components, capacitors, resistors, and transistors. Transistors are really useful as the basis for modern computing, and they operate most commonly as electronic switches or as amplifiers. The other thing we looked at this week was the idea of gravitational potential energy compared to electrical potential energy, and how this compares to storing energy in volts. We looked at how capacitors are used to store electric charge and how the potential decreases as we travel from one plate to the other. Throughout all of this, please remember that potential is just another word for voltage, so if you're struggling, this is something you can think about. This series of videos is going to give you a greater understanding of the topics we've looked at this week. Please complete the homework that's due by 9am on Wednesday and then I'll see you in class. Here on the table you can see I've got some of the components that we covered this week in EMA. So we've got resistors which we've encountered before and if you get them from um, a catalogue they'll come on a strip like this and you just pull them off so they're normally sold by the hundred or so. Um, we talked about how to identify them and that's also covered in one of the video topics this week. Um, the main thing you'll see is you go look for the metal coloured band but these will be different colours depending on the tolerance and on the resistor value. Next up we've got a capacitor. This is an electrolytic capacitor which means it has a positive and a negative terminal. Not all capacitors do. The important thing with electrolytic capacitors is you need to connect them into the circuit the cor correct way around. If you fail to do this they will run the risk of getting hot and going bang. You can identify the negative terminal the same way that you would with LEDs. So the longer leg on the component is the positive terminal and the shorter leg is the negative terminal. Some of them are also marked and you can see on this one you've got a negative sign on the negative edge of the component. Finally, we have a bipolar junction transistor. Other types are available. This is just one that I got out of my component box. It's got three terminals. So we've got one for the base, one for the collector, and one for the emitter. And you need to check your data sheet to identify which terminal is which. You can tell um, which way around to identify it because it will have a flat edge and a rounded edge, which is there you go, you can see that there. I've got a flat edge and a rounded edge, and that's used to identify the pins. A resistor is one of the most basic electronic components that exists. You can see some pictures of them on the screen now, and you can see they come in many different shapes and sizes, and there's a matchstick there to give you an idea of their scale. The main role of a resistor is to limit or to resist the current flowing through a circuit. So, why is that actually useful? Well, we don't want large currents to damage sensitive pieces of equipment, so if we put a resistor in the connection with them, then we can make sure that we operate a circuit safely. There are many different sizes of resistor, and a bigger resistor value means it will resist current more. Resistance is measured in ohms with the symbol omega. This is a Greek letter, and it's a capital omega. In circuit diagrams, resistors are shown by a rectangle. However, in some places you may also see resistors drawn as a zigzag line. Most circuits use resistors which look something like this, and here's a zoomed in one. Now we're going to look at how we tell the value of this resistor. The coloured bands are used to identify the value. First, look for the metal colour, which is gold or silver, and then move your resistor so this is on the right-hand side. In the example here, we've got a gold band, so I've moved that to be on the right. Next, read the colour of the first band on the left. In this case, it's a brown one. Then we're going to read the second from the left, which in this case is black. Then you need to look up the colour codes for your resistors and put these numbers together. So we know that brown is 1 and black is 0, so if we put these together, we end up with 10. Now we're going to read the colour of the third band, which in this case is yellow. This is a multiplication factor, and what we now need to do is to multiply the number from the first two bands by this multiplication factor. So in this example we end up with 10 times 1 times 10 to the power of 4. This gives us the value of the resistor in ohms, which we can see is 100,000 ohms, or 100k ohms for short. 
If we go back to the metal colored band, in this case gold, this gives us the value of the tolerance of the resistor. And this tells us how close to the manufactured value the actual value is likely to be. So in this case, gold is plus or minus 5% accuracy and silver would be a different value. Learning resistor colour codes is something that most engineers learn how to do because they interact with them so often. And here's a slightly more light-hearted look at what this means. Capacitors are components that can store electrical energy. How is this different to a battery? Well, batteries provide energy from a chemical reaction inside them, whereas capacitors are purely concerned with electrical energy. Capacitors can't store energy for as long as a battery, but they can charge and discharge much faster, which has many applications in circuits. Here's some pictures of capacitors. You can see there are many different types, but they all have two legs. Each leg is then attached to a plate inside the capacitor, and there's a space between these plates with a filling of a dielectric material. This is reflected in the circuit symbol for a capacitor, which shows these two parallel plates with a gap between them. You may also see capacitor circuit symbols which look like this, where one of the plates is curved. This means it's a polarised capacitor, which means it has a positive side and a negative side and has to be connected the correct way around in a circuit for it to function correctly. The simplest form of a capacitor is the parallel plate capacitor. Here's our circuit symbol once more with the parallel plates. Remember, this is actually a 3D shape so I've made my plates circular. We're now going to look in detail at what happens between those plates. So there are my plates and I'm now going to fill it with a dielectric material. Dielectric materials have a property associated with them which is called the relative permittivity. This has a symbol epsilon r. Essentially relative permittivity is a measure of how much energy can be stored in a material. A material with a higher relative permittivity can store more energy than one with a lower permittivity. We can calculate the value of a capacitor using the formula C is equal to epsilon naught, epsilon R, A, all over D. What does this mean? Well, C is for capacitance, and this is measured in farads with the symbol F. If you want to select a capacitor for use in a circuit, this is the value that you look for, rather than anything to do with the relative permittivity of the material inside. Epsilon naught is the permittivity of free space, and this is a universal constant. Epsilon r is the relative permittivity of the material inside the capacitor. This has no units, and it's simply a multiplication factor. A is the area of the plate in metres squared, and in this situation, remember, we've got a circular plate, so you'll have to substitute in the area of a circle. Finally, D is the distance between the plates, and this is measured in metres. A larger value of capacitance means that more energy can be stored inside it. Capacitance values are usually in the pico, nano or microfarad range, so instead of going into the specifics of how the insides of a transistor work, instead we're going to look at how they're connected into circuits. Here's our BJT transistor with its three terminals, the base, the collector and the emitter. I've connected this into a simple circuit. I've got a power supply of 5 volts at the top and 0 volts at the bottom, or ground as we sometimes call it. I've got a switch which is controlling the input to the transistor and then I've got a light connected to the output. When the switch is pressed on, so it's pressed down and it's connected, a signal is applied to the base, which is the input side of the transistor. The base acts as the on switch for the transistor and allows current to flow between the collector and the emitter. So you can see the arrow on the transistor symbol indicates which direction the current will flow through. This means that the light which we've connected can turn on. On the other hand, when the switch is off, there's no signal applied to the base. This means the base acts as the off switch for the transistor and does not allow current to flow between the collector and the emitter. This means that the light is off. So how is this useful? Well, we can use a small input signal to control a much larger output signal. 
So what I've done is I've made a bit of a modification to my circuit. I've replaced a lamp with some LEDs and you can see I've got my transistor connected through to a slightly different circuit on the input side. So when the switch is pressed on, that means that current can flow through the resistor and the LED to the base and the LED that's connected to the base turns on, but it's not very bright. The base then acts as the on switch for the transistor and allows current to flow between the collector and the emitter. This means that the LED on the right hand side of the circuit turns on and is much brighter because we can allow a much larger current to flow through this part of the transistor. The current that flows through the collector and emitter can be much larger than the current needed to turn the base on. This is very useful in controlling high power circuits. So how is this useful? We can replace the manual switch in our model this time with something like a sensor input. So here's my circuit diagram and you can see on the input to the transistor I've replaced everything with a simple light dependent resistor. This component will reduce its resistance when it's exposed to lots of light. So what happens? When enough light shines on the light dependent resistor its resistance drops. The current can flow through the resistor to the base. The base then acts as the on switch for the transistor and allows current to flow between the collector and the emitter, so the LED on the output side turns on. This basic circuit can be adapted to be the control for other circuits, so it doesn't have to be a light dependent resistor on the input, you can use a touch switch or anything else you can think of. Another way this is useful is we can replace the manual switch in our model with something like a high frequency input. What does that mean? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to apply an input signal to the base. And what I've used here is a square wave. You can see it's got periods where it's on or high and off when it's low or zero. We're going to apply this high frequency input to the base. When a high signal is applied to the base, current can flow from the collector to the emitter and the LED will turn on. When a low signal is applied to the base, current cannot flow from the collector to the emitter and the LED will turn off. This is particularly useful because the pattern is repeated due to our input waveform and it can happen very fast, many times each second, certainly much faster than you can push that switch.